Welcome everyone to the next episode of the Microsoft Defender for Endpoint Ninja Show. So at this episode, we are at the fourth and we are talking about attack surface reduction. It's a big topic. My name is Heike, I will be your host and I'm joined today by an expert named Jeff. And Jeff is part of our customer experience team, but Jeff, why don't you introduce yourself quickly? Hi, uh, my name is Jeff Cook. I'm actually based out of Australia. So um, I work with the customer acceleration team for Defender for Endpoint and M365D. Thank you so much. Thanks for being my expert on the show. Before we dive in, um, I want to remind everyone that there is a ask a question button that you can use to ask a question. And uh, we will do our best in the back end. We have a lot of SMEs here that can help us answer your questions. If your questions wasn't answered, you can also use um, the share your voice. It's not just for questions. It's also for feedback, recommendations, sending us some love. It's under aka.ms slash ninja show, share your voice. And then when you're on that page already, you can also scroll down a little bit. Of course, watch previous episodes as well as have a click at our, our bonus content. There will also be... Um, always be some new content for you that you can use, some little nice animated GIFs, background images, and such. So, and with that, Jeff, let's dive in. So if you would have to explain someone in a quick summary, what is attack surface reduction in Microsoft Defender for Endpoint, what would that be? Okay, so um, attack surface reduction is a set of features that live under the MDE umbrella. Um, it's a group of features that are baked that are focused on hardening your device. So the goal here is not so much to use a signature to detect something or EDR to detect something, but we're just going to try and close off all of the attack surfaces that we can to decrease the ability for attackers to gain access to your environment. Uh, would you like me to run through a list of the features that we have in this group? I think that would be awesome so that just everybody gets an understanding of what kind of features and capabilities are part of it. Awesome, I might just share my screen so I can put a slide up. So as mentioned, it's a set of features. So we'll start with hardware-based isolation. So hardware-based isolation is where we take Edge or Office and we'll put that into a bubble. So what will happen is you'll be, you define yourself a circle of trust, for lack of a better term, of the things that are yours and you trust and you're happy to run in a standard browser or a standard uh, Office. Then when you go outside of them, you can basically link, you can jump into an isolated bubble and then anything that happens inside that bubble is going to be contained. So we're basically isolating that, that activity into an isolated area so it's not going to affect your main environment. So when you say bubble, we are talking about a virtual machine. Uh, it has only core technologies that are needed to basically run that application. Yes. Um, you can basically control whether you can copy and paste into there as well or whether you can print from there as well. So it's really isolating to a virtual bubble. And then once you close that bubble, everything is gone. It'll go away, yes. So this is for, you were saying, browsers as well as Office applications. Yeah, we released Application Guard for Office fairly recently. I think I can't remember the exact date. Next one I can read is Application Control. I think this is really key. I remember the time where we allowed everything to run until we knew it was bad. <laughs> I think this is basically the other way around. We say, no, nothing is allowed to run unless I define that this is actually a good thing. So that's exactly right. This is turning it around from let's find something that's bad and stop it to actually saying only things we're going to allow are going to run. Um, and that's... That's a nutshell of it. The few things I did want to call out about application control in Microsoft is it's generally been hard to manage in general. So this sort of application um, trust model. Um, so what we've done to make this easier is we have a concept called the managed installer. So what that is, is if you're using Config Manager or Intune to deploy your applications, we can basically tell application control that if you get an application installed by one of those tools, it's trusted. So instead of having to recut an image or do something to get this app the application trusted, we just deploy it through your standard infrastructure and it will be trusted in your application control. 
which makes life cycle managing everything much easier in that area. Uh, the other thing I'll say is we also enabled intelligent security graph integration. So um, similar sort of thing, it's um, maintaining application control policies can be a challenge. With this one, what you can do is say, if Microsoft trusts anything, so if it's a known trusted application, we're gonna let that run. So when you go through your application policies and it is not allowed to run, we can reach out and check and say, oh, we have, Microsoft knows this and it's trusted, so we're gonna let that run in your environment. Um, allows users a little bit more flexibility while maintaining a level of security through app control. And you can basically com combine these two, right? So you can say, I'm trusting the Microsoft reputation of their apps that they know, plus, um, as you said, the management piece where people deploy apps and then these apps that have been deployed through these uh, management solutions will also be allowed. Yeah, so it's very flexible in what you want to do. It's basically controlled by options at the build. So when you're building the policy, you tell it what you want it to do and it will honor those things. So yes, you can combine both. Wow. Yeah, I think that makes it much easier than it was uh, in, I guess, a long time ago because um, it's not brand new that we have that management, but it was a pain <clears throat> before. <laughs> Good. So let's keep going. Exploit protection. Yeah, um, so effectively there's a bunch of low level mitigations that can be applied to an operating system to harden them. So things like uh, mandatory ASLRs, um, data execution prevention that get applied to apps and the OS. And this is a way that we can actually deploy them. So um, you can go in, you can go through and set them. Um, there's I think 20 of them or so and you're able to actually go and configure them and then export that and apply that across your entire fleet to apply those low level mitigations to your entire fleet. Okay, so next on the list, we have network protection. And I think this is something like smart screen in the box. Yeah, so um, everyone's probably seen that big red screen that comes up when you're using Internet Explorer, hopefully not Internet Explorer, but Edge now. Um, they've seen that big red screen saying, you probably shouldn't go to that website because it's known to be bad. In network protection, we're actually taking that down to the operating system level. So we're able to block ex we're able to block calls externally to that, to known bad URLs at the OS level. So that's really important for third-party browsers or apps that are calling that known bad sites. The one thing I did want to say before we move on is this one, um, while important in its own right, is actually leveraged by a bunch of the MDE features that we use now, and this sort of moves into web protection. Uh, so stuff like indicators where we can define URLs or IPs and allow block or warn on them, and we can do MCAS integration where if we unsanction an app, it'll actually come down to the device and be blocked at that site, and category filtering where we can block sites based on the category all rely on net protection to actually enable and work. So it is by itself, it's a good, it's a very good product and part of this suite, but it's also important for a lot of the other MDE features that we rely on. You hopefully will show us a little bit about that because that's super interesting, especially talking about um, how other features rely on it. And we might be uh, diving deeper into this a little bit. Sounds good. So you already touched on web protection. Um, anything to add? No, and we'll talk about that a little bit more when we run through net protection in more detail. So last three, controlled folder access. Yeah, so this is the ability to only allow known and trusted applications to write to your protected folders on your device. So in the scenario of ransomware, where you download ransomware.exe, it's generally not well known, generally not trusted. So it's going to go and try and encrypt your entire MyDocs folder. This will stop that from happening. Uh, obviously, you can define the local folders you want to protect and you can allow apps through as you see fit through policy. But the basic theory is if it's not known and not trusted, it won't write to your protected folders. And then we have device control. Yeah, so this is the ability to control uh, USB connections, access, etc. on the device. So you create a policy and you define your ID, device IDs, etc. And then apply to the device. And depending on that, you'll be able to use, read or write to those devices. We've also got um, policies for printers, etc. So the ability to control what happens with your external devices is device control. And the last one, it's the same name as the actual category pillar umbrella attack surface reduction rules. So is this now how you configure all of this or is this something different? 
No, so this is actually a big one for the last one. Um, so what we've done is we've generated a group of rules that close off mo a lot of the common attack surfaces in a device. Um, so these are rules that we can put in place on a device to do certain things. So I'll give you an example of this. Um, I tend to pick on macros because macros are awesome. They can do a lot of really good things. They're also a vector for attack. So if I can make a rule which says you can run all your macros, but I'm not going to allow any office document to create a child process. That means if a, if a malicious macro comes in and tries to create a child process to ransomware your device, etc., it's just not going to be able to do it. We don't know the file. We don't know anything else about it, but we know you're not allowed to run a child process. So we've got 15 or so rules around that, which we can apply to a device. And then we're basically closing off all of those um, attack services effectively. Uh, will you be able to show us this later on in our uh, show here? Because I think this is really important and especially the different options that people have to configure it uh, would be great if we could have a look into that. Um, all right, so I'll just bring my screen up and I'll talk a bit about attack surface reduction. So as mentioned, we want to help close off as many common attack surfaces as we can in a device. So it's not about trusting or not trusting. It's really about just a behavior. So I know this behavior is known to be a attacking or a malicious behavior. I just want to stop it. We understand there are certain things you need to leave. So we have exclusions and other things to enable you to make this useful in your environment, but it's basically blocking the behavior. Um, it doesn't mean you don't need AV or EDR and all those other things because this is part of our layer defense. So we've got about 15 of these um, in a number of different areas. So email, webmail, WIMI, this one's an office one we're looking at, Windows credentials, et cetera. I thought I'd walk you through what the block all, all office applications for creating child processes actually looks like. So while we're on this page, um, we deal with GUIDs quite a lot when we're talking about tax service reduction rules. So the GUID for this one is this one here. And when you configure it, and I'll be doing this through PowerShell so I can do that live on the device, you can configure it through MEM and you can configure it through Config Manager and GPO, but I'll be using PowerShell for this demo. So the states that matter are block is one, audit is two, and one is six. And I'll show you what that means. So let's just jump into PowerShell for now and jump to my ASR script. So get mppref is just the standard, um, basically getting the preferences from Defender on your device. So I'm just going to run that and find out what actual configuration I'm in. So down the bottom, we'll see, I'm going to get my details now, and I'm in two. Now, two is in audit. So if I go through back into here, I can see audit there. And if I click go and run on my macros, I'll run that, and that'll just run quite happily. I'm not stopping the actual behavior. I'm just auditing it so I can get that data from the event viewer on the device or from my MBE tenant through advanced hunting. There's also a report in the MBE tenant as well. So that's quite happily launched PowerShell. I'll just close that at the moment. We do recommend because there is these rules will have some impact in your environment because they are blocking behaviors. So we do recommend that you do audit. So you do audit so you get an idea of the impact of turning these rules on, on your devices and which files you actually need to exclude. So let's go back to my PowerShell script. And I'm just going to set this. <clears throat> Why do go back there? I think we have a beautiful view in the console actually that help people understand the impact that files um what the impact would be on users for specific files if you would actually put these kind of uh, rules in block mode but we can only show this once you put them in audit mode right correct uh you need to be actually getting telemetry through auditing to actually be able to view that data so it's a, it's a great report and it does give you ideas about exceptions and what devices you can target, um, but you do need the audit data. So once we are happy we can block this, I'm just going to turn this into block mode now. I'm not sure how well everyone knows PowerShell, but really all I'm doing here is setting a rule ID is the ID we looked at and attack service rule action is enabled. You'll notice this one here was audit and this is coming out at the bottom as one. So now that's set into block mode. Now, if I go back to here, I don't need to reboot or anything, and I run that exact same macro, it's going to give me a VB error because we've actually blocked that behavior, and I will get a pop-up down here telling me an action has been blocked. So you're getting the visual cue that we've actually blocked something, and you're getting the toast pop-up saying we're blocked. So that's attack service reduction actually blocking a behavior. I might just actually clear. Okay. And you can also set this at warn. 
So what Warn will do is it will actually allow you to run the you'll run the macro. The macro will error and it will give you the same error we saw for block, but then it'll allow you to unblock. So you can actually click unblock, run the macro again, and that macro will work. So that gives you a little bit more flexibility to give your users the chance to choose whether or not they run this or not. So that's um, ASR, ASR rules. Hockey, any questions, any thoughts? So uh, what is our recommendations to customers to for what use audit, enabled, warn? Like uh, for me, warn is like, oh, wow. I mean, every user would just like, of course, let my macro run. Like what's um, your experience working with customers on how they use it? And yeah, that would be great to hear. So the reporting we do in advanced hunting is for 30 days. Um, the TVM report gives you 45, I believe, and the other, the actually ASI report gives you, I think, about 30 days. For me, audit for that amount of time, you get a really good idea of the files and the devices that are actually impacted. So you might have a couple of rules that you'll be able to turn on for your entire fleet really quickly because they didn't hit anything in that time frame. I do have to put the caveat there. If a behavior or an action happens every 45 days or 50 days, um, you might get a um, you might get a blockage because we haven't seen that in auditing, but realistically, that's re that's fixable through a support ticket, etc. So for me, you audit, identify the rules and devices you can turn on quickly, and then work through the files you need to exclude, so that when you start excluding those files, you'll actually be able to add more and more devices to the rules. At some point, you might not be able to add any more devices or any more rules, but get as much of that coverage out as you can. Does that make sense? That makes sense. Now you brought me up to a next question. You mentioned advanced hunting. So we have that report um, in the security center, but then why and when would you use what? The report versus advanced hunting? So the report gives you um, a GUI version and a lot of information about what's happening in your environment. Um, I like using advanced hunting because it gives me the ability to pull the details out and then triage it or process it as I choose. So some of the things I generally do is identify per rule how many devices aren't impacted. So I can do that through advanced hunting and anti-joins, uh, whereas I don't get that sort of feed out of the um, ASR reports. Um, just things like that. So giving you the ability to process your own data and identify what do you think okay. you can do with the rules? So, and then, um, of course, you now used uh, PowerShell. You mentioned we can also use Microsoft Endpoint Manager. And there is somewhere device policies, baselines, and then you can actually turn on all the individual rules in audit mode. Made pretty easy, pretty simple. Or how is your experience with managing that in an enterprise across multiple devices? Yeah, so we supply GUI versions for, um, well, MEM. So MEM, which for Microsoft Endpoint Manager, we provide a GUI version through that web console for that. We can go through and select those um, as you see fit. I might just quickly show you that. So if I look through here, this is my Endpoint Security. This is my Microsoft Endpoint Management console. This is the Endpoint Security node and tax service reduction rules. So Uh, you asked about audit, so I have an ASR audit all rule. So this is the policy, and I'll just jump down to the config settings. So as per standard with these, name, description, who I'm targeting it at, and then these are the rules I've actually got configured. Um, for this one, it's audit all, so I've just gone yeah. through and selected audit mode for all of these. Yeah. Um, you can also add um, protected fo excluded folders through here as well. So. Um, I've just got a fake folder called ASR Audit All enabled um, just to show that. So all I do is I create this policy and I apply it to this group and then it will push down to the device and you are now auditing. Anything else that you would like to tell the audience about attack surface reduction rules? Anything that we forgot that we should tell everyone? You know, you mentioned MEM and GPO. You can also deploy it through PowerShell and, sorry, you mentioned um, MEM and Config Manager. You can also use PowerShell and GPO as you see fit. The other thing we sort of talked about is targeting exclusions. So these will only turn on to devices you've targeted them on. So there may be cases where a device actually isn't able to have these rules turned on because there is a business critical, um, business critical application or file that will not be able to run with these rules. So there is some identification of well, the auditing and the identification of what can and can't be turned on is critical. 
Okay, I'm asking, um, do you have uh, access to the admin portal where we can see the reports of ASR and because you can also, I think, add exclusions right there? But you can see here are all the rules that I've been um, breaching because I've got stuff in audit. So you can see here, I've got some blocks, some in audit. That's the test macro I was just looking at. Um, you can see the device names, et cetera, through there. And they're all the ones I've been actually, that's all the activity. And you can see that in the graphical format. But look at configurations. This will tell me what my, um, what my environment looks like. So a few of these have got nothing turned on. A um, few of them have everything turned on. It sort of depends on which configuration they are, but basically gives you an idea to quickly look at what's there. Okay, and then you can add exclusions. So here you can see um, all the files that have been that need to be excluded to actually have impact, and you can click on them and identify what the impact would be if they actually um, if they actually were excluded, and you have that data down here. Um, so that's the report there. Uh, would you like to look at the advanced hunting? Uh, advanced hunting. Wow, I don't want to put you right on the spot with advanced hunting, but if you offer it, please do. All right. So advanced hunting for ASR rules. It lives in the device events um, container. So if I, this is not the same one, all right. So if I open device events and pop the correct thing, there we go. Apologies, this is slow. Okay, so if I run this, I'm going to get device events where action type contains ASR. I'm just going to remove the device ID columns and device name columns because they've got no reference here. And that's going to run in the back end, just wait for this to load. And here you can start seeing timestamp, what the file name, the path is. There's a huge amount of data available about what's happening. Yeah, and the beauty about advanced hunting, of course, is you can now combine it with some other interesting entities that you want to correlate it or like where this happens but a user is locked on or we have this and then you have a older version of office or whatever it is right so you can really go crazy um, and really find exactly what you're looking for for your organization yeah so as an idea going on that like this is a really quick query device events timestamp 30 days ago same one as asr but I'm just working out how many rules I'm actually breaking in my audit. And from there, I can work out if I can turn this on really quickly. So, you know, for these ones, uh, Office Executable Content Blocked has one across 30 days. So it's probably something I could look at working out what's blocking that, whether I can exclude it. And then that might be something I could turn on fairly quickly. Whereas if I go down to one of these, um, they've got a lot more activity. So maybe they'll take a little bit longer to identify what I can target and what I can exclude. So as a summary, um, attack surface reduction rules give you more granular control over the behavior of probably applications. You, you mentioned email. We have Office. There is some user um, behaviors. Uh, but instead of just like, yeah, let's block macros, you can be really granular and um, not interrupt, for instance, the finance department um, with all the amazing macros that they have for their calculations. Yeah, so that is the goal. So we have, um, you know, there's a bunch of stuff around macros. So block all applications from creating child processes, block office applications from creating executable content, block applications from injecting code into other processes, block Win32 APIs from office macros are just some. Um, but if you turn, if you, a lot of macros won't use that. It depends on how complex they are. Some will, but a lot of the um, in-house ones probably won't use all of them. And once you've audited and identified one, what's in use, had a chat to the owner of that, whether it's critical, whether we can rewrite it or whether it just needs to be excluded, you can move forward with a much better understanding of the impact these rules are going to have. 
want to ask you, do you have any additional demos for, I think we talked about network protection that we want to dive deeper into that we can go through. Again, probably it would be great. A quick reminder, network protection, you were saying it's being used for our Defender for Cloud Apps integration, um, other file IOCs and all these kind of things that people um, configure in the console and web content filtering, web category filtering. I don't remember what it, the right one was. <laughs> Sorry, I, um, that was my mistake on the first bit. Um, yeah, so you're perfectly correct. So what we've done, uh, let's, let's just work through the demo and I'll explain as we go. So if I open Edge, and this is actually the smart screen basically testing site we use. So I'm just going to grab that and I'm going to put that into a Edge browser. And that'll bring up a big red screen. So people have probably all, all have seen this a number of times where smart screen testing is basically a test site we use to, and we've marked it unsafe so you can get a, a nice safe um, red screen for smart screen testing. So we've gone there and it said, this site has been reported unsafe. This is smart screen, so you can actually click through it if you choose to. Um, it's not net protection yet. What we've done is we've taken that down to the network layer. So let's start by looking at how we configured. So what I'm going to do here is actually configure it in enabled. So set MPPREF, enable net protection, enabled, and then just validate that by getting that exact setting and checking it. So I'll just play that. And now we know that's set at one. So one is actually block. So if we look at this one, it's really just going to use a wget to go and get the smart screen testing and see if it can connect. So let's let that run. And it should come out with an error, basically saying an SSL block and I can't go there. So and then PowerShell, of course, doesn't give you a nice button to still go there. <laughs> what? Uh, it will, actually. So ah. It will. We've just got to wait for this to turn up. So I can click oh. this, and that'll actually unblock the smart screen link and I'll be able to actually go back to that site. Um, I'm not going to do that for this one, actually, why not? So unblock that, and then let's run this again. <laughs> I didn't know that you actually can do this. This is awesome. That was a great question. Yeah, so that's quite happily gone through now. So that's the smart screen part of it. But you can see we had a block experience, and then you had the ability to click through, um, and it was blocking at this layer. So that's actually the smart screen. That's the net native network protection. I did mention that we had the ability to do indicators and... MCAS and web content filtering as well. So Jeff, you showed us something in PowerShell, you showed us something in Edge. Um, so is Smart Screen only available for Edge and Microsoft software tools, or does that work in the box or in the browser um, across different tools? That's another great question. Um, so no, this is at the network layer. So it will work as happily in PowerShell as it will for Chrome or for other third-party browsers or applications. Chrome will use, is there even a difference? Like we'll use smart screen and not network so, protection or is it using network protection or like? <laughs> no, so Edge, control, Edge has smart screen in it and has the smart screen agent, which does this blocking for us. When we're outside of Edge, we need we rely on net protection to provide that blocking. So we're using the smart screen feed through net protection to block the same sites, but it's not it's network protection rather than smart screen that's doing the blocking. Got it, got it. Um, so if I click on smart screen, it's not going to work very well because I've just enabled that. So I might have to use one of my other ones. Um, I'll come back to showing you Chrome in a second. I might just talk through indicators and then we can work back and show that in Chrome. So indicators, you can put an IP or a URL into your console. You can set it to be warn, block, allow, and then that'll get pushed down to your device. So whenever I try from this device to go to that URL, it'll give me uh, the experience that I've defined in the policy. So if I look at msn.com, I've set that to block in the console. So I'm going to run this here, and I should get a 200, uh, sorry, a non-200 uh, SSL um, broken message and then a nice pop-up on the side. Now, this one I won't be able to click through because I've set this to block. With the other one, you saw I could actually click through it with a with a um, unblock. This one I can't. So the, the one that you had before was smart screen test page that you didn't set to block. It's just our reputation. Like if there was another web page where we had a bad reputation, you could click through because it's not set by you to block, but everything that you set on block, people cannot bypass it. Yes. So I don't know if you saw the message pop up, which didn't have an unblock. 
um, because I've set that as an indicator to block and you're not allowed to click through. Uh, this one here, I've actually set to warn. So I can run that and it'll actually give me a similar experience to um, smart screen or the smart screen feed because it um, is worn. So that'll pop up with worn. Okay, and we wait for the pop-up because I need to click unblock on that one. Um, unblock, and then I can click that, that'll unblock it on my device. And then I run that again, and that'll work quite happily. And that's a choice you have as an admin, whether you can actually use this or not, whether, whether you want it to block or just warn. So why is that loading? Um, this is done usually in the Microsoft 365 Defender portal to do this for the whole org and not via PowerShell, right? Yes, I'm using it in PowerShell so I can actually test quickly. Um, I'd actually configure the console. Sorry, I'd, I'd configure the indicators, etc., in the console. And I'll show you that in a second. Let's just get to Chrome. So I'm just going to plug in the MSN page. And this isn't anything to do with the Chrome browser. It's just the network connection is going to be detected by network protection and it's going to be blocked trying to go through. It'll give you a page here that will basically say, I can't get to that URL, and we'll get a pop-up over here telling us the same, similar ones to the ones we've seen before, telling us we can't do that. All right, so now we can see that's been blocked, can't provide a secure connection, and I get blocked by my admin. Now, remember, that was the one that was, um, was blocked. You would have, in the smart screen, which unfortunately I have blocked, so I can't do that here, or the worn one, get a worn device, which shows you allow, and you can click through as you see fit. But that's just showing you doing this on a third-party browser. Which shows me it's using the network protection, like the built-in um, smart screen in the box and not smart screen in the browser in Edge because of the experience that you have. Yeah, so smart screen in Edge is um, a standalone thing, but we use the same feeds. So we'll block the same sort of thing. If you've got smart screen on, that'll be blocked in Edge through smart screen. Anywhere else, it'll block through um, network protection. Uh, we looked at indicators. We can also do um, MCAS. So if you connect the MCAS, sorry. Um, MDA, like that. Cloud App Security, uh, Microsoft Defender for Cloud Apps. <laughs> if, you, if you connect that um, and then you unsanction apps, that'll flow back to Defender for Endpoint. And then that'll push those um, sanctioned, unsanctioned URLs or service URLs back down to the device and they'll be blocked at the device level. We also do, as you said, web content filtering where you can choose our uh, um, I don't want adults, I don't want hand, high bandwidth sites to be available. That will flow down to the device and then those will be blocked on the device rather than at like a proxy or a firewall layer. I want to add to the Microsoft Defender for Cloud Apps integration. This is key. I remember when the integration with Defender for Endpoint didn't exist, um, I don't know, two years ago maybe, people had to first basically download something and then get it deployed on the different devices that this is the unsanctioned application they don't want to like run on the, um, or like get access to. This is now a one click integration and with a click of a button, the indicator is set. So this is huge. This is, there's no, not, 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 not much work to do besides identifying those applications and saying block it. And also the other thing I want to call out is we're actually blocking it on the device. So if I'm in a corporate network, um, sorry, in general, it used to be that block on a proxy. So you'd actually go to your corporate network. You couldn't be able to access that because we're doing some device level. I could be at a cafe. I could be anywhere and I'm still going to be blocking those sites because network protection is on the OS layer. It's on the OS level yeah. than the network, rather than the external network layer. Now we talked about network protection. Um, do you want to still go in the portal and show us something about IOCs or about web content filtering? I think you mentioned you have something there to show. All right. So let's go and have a look at indicator settings. So if I go down to settings in the M365D portal and I go to endpoints, I can jump into the indicators area. So here are indicators. Here you can see we have file hashes, we have IP address, and we have URLs. I'll just jump straight to the URLs page. And here you can see the URLs that I actually had configured, apart from the not a real URL too, which is obviously not a real URL, um, msn.com and Microsoft Edge Welcome. So in here, you can have a look at how you can configure them. 
So this one is set to warn, as mentioned. I can allow that, I can audit that, I can block that. And if I do block it, I can decide whether I want to generate an alert or not. So if I just want to block it, but I actually don't want to be notified because I'm happy that I'm protected, I can untick that and then it won't actually show. Uh, if you are generating alert, you have to obviously do severities and things like that. So that's the indicators. If I have my Defender for Cloud Apps configured to sync, you'll actually see in here Defender for Cloud App indicators, and that will flow directly through to your device and block in the same way. The other things we're talking about was web content filtering. Before you hop there, before it loads quickly, just a question. Um, so probably you want an alert if you know it's like, I don't know, it's a C2, it's like a whatever very bad URL, but for other more just websites that you would like to block, you probably don't generate an alert or how are our customers um, configuring that? A bit of both, to be honest. Um, stuff that, so if you get something from a TI vendor that says, hey, you need to check this now, you might want to put it on an alert and make it a very high priority so that when it does flag, it's right at the top of your uh, incident list. If it's something that you just decided is not, well, maybe it's an old um, an old C2 that hasn't been used, or maybe it's something you just don't want people going to, then you might want to say, I'm just happy that it's blocking and I don't actually want to know what's going on. I don't want to be alerted every time that happens. And we are talking about alerts, not telemetry. So this is when it pops up into your alert or incident queue is what that tick box is about. So. Sometimes you just don't need that noise in that alert queue, so you just untick that box and they won't, it won't bother that queue. Uh, and web content filtering. So this one, this is an example one I've created, and here I've just gone through and let that load. And I can go through and select which ones I actually want to allow and disallow. So I'm blocking image sharing peer-to-peer, -peer. I might want to add download sites to that. I can choose which device groups in my environment I want to target this at. I've currently given this to all, but I can be more selective per device. And then I save that and that will apply in the same way down to the device and then net protection will actually pick that up and block that. Okay, so this is really, really cool. So people can use the console to really configure web content filtering um, on device basis, like it's not all or nothing. Um, good, I think, Jeff, because attack surface reduction is such a huge topic and we are still in our introductional um, section here in the show, but you really went deep already in a few areas. I think we covered everything. We discussed um, what all the individual features are. Um, most of our customers, I think, are using a combination, of course, of all of them. It's not one or the other. It's like a complementary, depending on your needs. Um, is there anything you would like to add as a closure from your side um, when it comes to attack surface reduction? Um, from my side of, from my point of view, I think it's important to understand what each of them do and then understand where they fit in your protection, um, in your protection area. So they all have different ways to do things and they all provide a level, of, a level of protection, which is great. You've got to work through each of them to identify how that would fit into your environment and where they best fit. So for me, you know, the pick two I picked out were attack surface reduction rules and net protection because I believe that they fit into most environments pretty easily uh, with a bit of a wounding. Um, the other ones take a little bit of work to make it, make sure they actually will fit your environmental requirements. Thank you so much. Um, Jeff, thank you for being my expert on today's show. I, I learned a lot. I hope the audience learned a lot too. Thank you so much for being on the show today. Absolute pleasure. So, Thanks everyone for watching. This was episode four. Next up is guest episode five. And we are going to talk about next generation protection, our AV solution in Microsoft Defender for Endpoint coming up. And again, if you have still questions, if you have feedback about the session, this um, can all be shared with me and I will share it with my experts and the team. Go to aka.ms slash ninja show and then share your voice. Thank you again for attending and hopefully see you next time around. Bye.